Good morning and welcome. Welcome to worship for this Sunday, December 3rd. Happy New Year. We hope you tuned in to our New Year's Eve service that we did online. You can look back and check that out anytime, but we're glad that you're starting this new year here in Church with God. The order of service is found right there on the screen, so simply follow along as we begin your day, your week, and your year with God. Let us begin. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of Christ, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now hear from our choir. from Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. 
In love, he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious name, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his promise, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fill for as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our Alleluia verse. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The child Jesus grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was twelve years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, searching for him. After three days they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to him. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We now confess our common Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our sermon hymn this day is Within the Father's House. Please sing along. Within the Father's house, the Son has found his home, and to his temple suddenly the Lord of life has come. The doctors of the law gaze on the wondrous child and marvel at his gracious words of wisdom undefiled. Yet not to them is given the mighty truth to know, to lift the earthly veil which hides incarnate God below. The secret of the Lord escapes each human eye, and faithful pondering hearts await the full epiphany. 
Lord, visit thou our souls, and teach us by thy grace, each dim revealing of thyself with loving awe to trace, till we behold thy face, and know as we are known, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, co-equal three in one. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus lived for 33 years, give or take, a a good, not not a long life by our standards, a decent life by standards back then, Um, really, really a shorter life than others lived. But 33 years is a long time, all things considered. Uh, Many of you have lived much longer. I know that I haven't quite gotten there yet, but the span of 33 years, a lot happens in 33 years. With Jesus, we know very little about the bulk of his life. We know about the three years of his public ministry, starting from when he was baptized by John of the Jordan, when he went off into the wilderness to be tempted, all the miracles, healing the sick, raising the dead, teaching, and then finally, of course, his cross, passion, death, and resurrection. We know a lot about that. We know a lot about his birth, his pre-birth, certainly, when he was in the womb for those nine months. We know about his birth. We know about when he was two years old, when the uh, wise men came to him, tune in on Wednesday for our Epiphany service, hear more about that. We know about all that. We know also about the flight into Egypt. But his formative years, from when he was a child, when he could really start talking, to the age of 30, we know very little about. Really, except this, this here in Luke chapter 2, verses 40 and following. We see Jesus when he was 12 years old. This is the only glimpse in Scripture of the, of the adolescent or pre-adolescent Jesus that we see of really his childhood of his formative years. And the Jesus there that we see is totally within character of the Jesus that we would see later on. He, but at the same time, he's in character of that, of a child, of a human being. This is something that we remember when we consider Jesus Christ. He is fully God, yes, but he is also fully man. And what do people who are fully man do? Well, sometimes they get into scrapes. And this is what Jesus is doing here. Let's take a look at this text. Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 40. The child Jesus grew, became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. The favor of God was upon Jesus from before he was born, through his birth, and onward, even through his childhood. Imagine in your house... If you've raised kids, if you've raised boys, teenage boys, perhaps you know that sometimes it feels like the Spirit of God isn't always in that household and isn't always in that place, especially as stuff happens. But certainly it was the case with Jesus. Um, He grew up in a religious household, in a very religious household. God knew the parents that he was going to give Jesus. God knew Mary and Joseph. We read earlier on in the in Matthew chapter 1, I believe, we read earlier on that Joseph was a devout man already. We knew that. Certainly Mary became a devout woman if she was not already to that point. Um, so Jesus was raised with devout parents who took him to temple, who took him to, uh, who took him to the high feast, the high days to make sacrifice, things like that. So his parents went to Jerusalem every year, we read, for the feast of the Passover. Most Jews would do this, most religious Jews. Not, not all of them would. There are some who probably didn't. There have been unfaithful people in all times and places. But those who were religious would go to Jerusalem for the Passover every year. And they went up when he was 12 years old to do this, just as they had every year. Now, maybe this was the first time they took Jesus. Maybe not. But there was something special about this trip. But you wouldn't have known it. They went for the Passover. They went for the meal. They went for the Seder. They went for the feast. Passover, of course, as you might know, is the time of remembrance of the exodus, of the time when the people of Israel were brought out of slavery and out of bondage in Egypt. Went to Jerusalem to do this. And there was a large crowd there with them. 
obviously. I mean, this was a big thing. Everyone convened on Jerusalem for this. We see this later on, certainly, um, around Jesus, the time of Jesus' death, which took place near the Passover. Lots of people converged on Jerusalem to do this. And so they went to Jerusalem, they did the Passover feast, and then they went on back. They went on back home. They went on back to, uh, to Nazareth. And while they were going, they noticed, well, Jesus wasn't with them. So they figured, well, um, well, maybe he's with some friends. Maybe he's found some people, found some buddies, something like that, to hang out with as they made that journey. So they went a day's journey already. And then night fell. And they figured, well, Jesus would certainly come back. He'd come back to us to spend the night with us, to spend the night in our tent or wherever we were staying. And then he wasn't there. He wasn't there. Isn't this a typical teenage or soon-to-be teenage boy? You send him out, he goes out with friends, he goes to hang out, whatever, and then the time comes for him to go home, and he wasn't there. He wasn't there at his curfew. Remember, Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man. This is certainly the humanity of Christ on full display. So they searched for him. They searched frantically for him. Now, you'd obviously, if you were a parent who had lost a child, you'd search frantically for that child. Maybe you'd call the police. Maybe you'd call social services, whatever the case may be. You'd do a lot to search for that child. Imagine if you were Mary and Joseph and he had to search for that child. Well, you weren't just searching for any ordinary child. You were searching for the Messiah, the Savior of the nations, the Son of God. So no pressure, Mary and Joseph, to find this child. No pressure to find him. So they searched frantically. They searched among the crowds. They open every tent door, whatever the case may be. They retrace their steps, overturning no stone along the way back to Jerusalem, even back to the temple. Because where do you go to find something? You go to the last place that you saw him. And the last place they saw Jesus would have been at the temple. And so what did they see? when they found him there. They saw him with the elders of the temple. They saw him with the religious leaders of the temple. And he was listening to them, sure. He was asking them questions. There was a good give and take. But what surprised them and what shocked them was that Jesus, their 12-year-old boy, was doing most of the teaching. That Jesus was the one who was teaching these teachers. Verse 46 of our text. And after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. So were his parents. I mean, we know that his parents by this point had seen some amazing things at Christmas and then at the Epiphany, at the visit of the wise men. They'd seen some extraordinary things. And then all of a sudden, this, that their son was teaching the teachers at the age of 12 years old. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. They were astonished. Perhaps to find that he had stayed behind, that he was, uh, that he had violated his curfew, whatever the case may be. They were astonished at that, but they were more astonished to see his wisdom on full display. Because Jesus, as a child, he was an ordinary child, just as he was when he was in his ministry. He didn't use his powers all the time in his ministry. He didn't use them all the time as his childhood. But what they were seeing here was a glimpse of who their son really was. Fully human, yes, but also fully God. Fully God to the point that he was teaching the religious teachers there. His parents saw this, were astonished, and his mother Mary said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. That's exactly what a parent would say. That might be exactly what you would say if your son had gone run it off if you were frantically searching for your son. So you can identify well with Mary as she said this. We've been so worried about you. Where were you? And he said to them, why were you looking for me? 
Did you not know that I must be in my Father's house? Jesus' humanity on full display as a boy getting into scrapes. Jesus' divinity on full display, fully cognizant of the fact that he was the Son of God fully cognizant of the fact that he was God himself, fully cognizant of his role as teacher of the teachers, as shepherd of the shepherds, fully cognizant of his role of savior of the nations. I've often wondered why Luke saw fit to include this story, because there had had to be some other awesome stories about Jesus. But I think he included this story to really shout, show us and really point, put it, to, really, um, to really put it on home that Jesus was no ordinary human being, that he was fully God, that he was also fully man. But even from his earliest state, he was doing amazing things, not just at his birth, but throughout his life. We can probably take this story perhaps as somewhat representative of what Jesus' life would be. But Mary and Joseph, oddly enough, and this is strange, and they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And I, I find that peculiar because they had seen so much from his life. They had seen his birth. They had seen the conception. They had seen the wise men. They had seen the angels. They had seen the shepherds. They had seen all that stuff. And they treasured these things, pondered them in their heart. Mary did. They didn't understand this. I find that peculiar. And for us... When we consider the things of Jesus, where do we fit in? Do we get it or do we not get it? Are we like Mary or are we like Joseph, whatever the case? Are we like them or do we get it? I, I, I don't know. Only you can answer that for yourself. I just find that quite peculiar from time to time. But what happens next, Jesus could tell that his parents were troubled. What did he do? He went back with them. He went down with them, came to Nazareth, and was submissive to them. But what did Mary do? Even though she didn't understand what Jesus was saying at that point, she treasured up all those things and pondered them in her heart. That's what we can do sometimes. If there is an aspect of Jesus, if there is an aspect of Scripture that we don't understand, we treasure it up, we read about it, we pray about it, we hear wise teachers talk about it. We ponder it in our heart and wait for the Holy Spirit to fully illumine us as to what these things might be. I think the other lesson that we can glean from this text is where do we find Jesus? Where do we look for Jesus? Mary and Joseph, you see, they looked everywhere for him. They weren't quite able to find him. Other people look for God in so many different places. There are people called pantheists. Pan meaning all, theos meaning God. They believe that God is everything. Panentheists believe that God is in everything. People look to nature for God. People look to other forms of wacky spirituality for God. People look for God in all sorts of places. Jesus' words, even at the age of 12, hold true. Where do you look for God? You look in his house. You look in the place that we know, where we know God will be. We look in his church. We look here to this place, and you can do it online, sure, but the best place to do it is in person in person so that you can not only look and find God in a physical location, but that you can receive God in a wonderful way, the sacrament of the altar. Where do you look for Jesus? Look for him where he has promised to be. Look for him in his house. Because when you're there, when you're there after so many years, however long it might be, of searching for God in unfulfilling places, in searching for God when the, where, in, in those places where he is not, after you have been exhausted and drained and tired out by that search so that at some point you just don't want to search for God anymore, maybe come back. Maybe come back to this place. Come back to this place where God promises to fill you up. Where God promises to fill your cup. Where God promises to be. Where you can receive Jesus 
for you in that memorial feast of his death, even his death on the cross. Where do we find Jesus today? We find him in his word. We find him in his house, in his sacrament, in this place. And then we go out and we tell others where to find God, where to find our Jesus, where to find our Savior and our salvation. So be its peace this day, O oh, you saints of God. You don't have to look far for Jesus. You don't have to be like Mary and Joseph and go crazy looking for him. Rather, you can find him here in this place, eager and ready to forgive you the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation, and at the ready to bring you to peace with God, a peace which passes all understanding, keeping your hearts and minds on Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that your Son, the eternal Word, became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Extend his praise into all the world that many more with us would come to hope in his steadfast love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, 
Your son diligently heard the word of God and grew in wisdom and stature, submissive to his earthly parents and always about your business and in your house. Keep the families of your church abiding in your word, eager to be found among your word and sacraments, and always treasuring your divine wisdom and favor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, give patience and endurance to all who are sick or in any need, and heal them according to your will. Receive our thanksgiving for every blessing and kindness you have shown to your people. Give comfort and hope to all who mourn. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, your Son has won redemption through his blood, granting the forgiveness of our trespasses. So now, according to the riches of your grace, receive those who come to your blessed sacrament this day. Grant worthy repentance and confidence fit and confident faith to all who commune, united in a sincere confession of faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day of our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Our closing hymn this day is, Let us all with gladsome voice. Please sing along. Let us all with gladsome voice Praise the God of heaven Who to bid our hearts rejoice His own Son hath given To this vale of tears he comes Here to serve in sadness That with him in heaven's fair homes We may reign in gladness we are rich, for he was poor. Is this not a wonder? Therefore praise God evermore. Here on earth and yonder, Christ our Lord and Savior dear, be thou ever near us. Grant us now a glad new year. Amen, Jesus, hear us. It is so very good to be with you this day, beginning your new year here on Sunday morning in the place where God promises to be, in his house. We invite you, they, 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 you can see we've still got the Christmas tree up, we've still got poinsettias behind me. It is still Christmas. It is still the 12 days of Christmas. But Christmas does end this week on January 6th with the Feast of the Epiphany. So we do invite you to join us on January 6th. That is this coming Wednesday right here online starting at 7 o'clock. But you can watch later than that if you'd like or the next day, whatever the case, case may be, starting in line at 7 o'clock in the evening for our service of Epiphany Evening Prayer. We hope that you'll join us for that service of light as we remember the, the journey of the wise men and all that, that happened in that narrative. Uh, also, I said it last week, bear in mind the upcoming uh, Southside Martin Luther King service. That's at St. Stephen's Lutheran Church on Monday, January 18th. So that's a couple of weeks from now. We hope that you'll join us for that. But for now, God bless you, be with you, go with you. Know that you can always find Jesus where he promises to be found, right here in his Father's house. God be with you. See you again soon. Bye-bye.